It wouldn't be a hot take if I said that Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings trilogy is one of the best trilogies of all time. Yes, your enjoyment of the extended editions can vary based on your patience and interest in lore. But that doesn't take away from the fact that those three feature film adaptations of J.R.R. Tolkien's works are straight up masterpieces. And everyone has been trying to recreate its magic to varying degrees of success or failure. Even Jackson and Warner Brothers reunited to usher a new generation of fans into Middle-earth with the Hobbit trilogy. And well, the results weren't exactly impressive. Several years later, when Amazon Studios took on the reins to give Tolkien's work the episodic treatment, there was a genuine sense of enthusiasm amongst fans and casual viewers. But that was quickly hampered by all the racist vitriol targeted towards the cast. The show's bland storytelling and over-reliance on the aesthetic established by Jackson and his team didn't help its case either. That said, the Rings of Power got the viewership it needed to greenlight a second season. And hence, with all the aforementioned baggage, here we are. A disclaimer, this review is based on the three episodes provided to the press by Prime Video. Developed by Patrick McKay and John D. Payne, The Rings of Power Season 2 opens with the revelation that back in the day, Sauron was betrayed by Adar and his fellow orcs, thereby forcing him to flee from Durnost. His path to gaining his latest visage, which is that of Halbrand, is what led him to Galadriel and the events of the first season. In the present day, we see Elrond rushing to High King Gil-galad to inform him about Galadriel's relationship with Sauron and how the use of the rings forged by Lord Celebrimbor and Sauron could lead to the downfall of the elves. Meanwhile, Sauron travels to the Southlands, which has now become Mordor, and gets himself captured by the orcs so that he can get close to Adar, and hopefully kill him. Elsewhere, Nori and Gandalf make their way through deserts and barren landscapes to get to Rune and see if the place holds any clues regarding the latter's memory. But they have to make haste, because they are being followed by someone. And last but not least, in Khazad Doom, Prince Durin and King Durin are still not on speaking terms because of the former's mistake of mining Mithril for Elrond. However, they have to join forces soon, because a mythical beast lying in the depths of Khazad Doom has awoken. I'll start off my thoughts on The Rings of Power Season 2 with a confession. I'm not the type of viewer who wants to have everything I'm seeing on screen explained to me. When I was young, naive, and maybe a little uneducated about the way any form of art was made, I wanted to look at what lay beyond the frame that was being presented before me. But as I've grown older, I have started to understand that even though the proverbial frame can seem limiting, it's what the artist does with it that makes it inspirational. That's a roundabout way of saying that everything that I learned from the Lord of the Rings movies satiated me. So the act of filling in the blanks in regards to certain mysterious plot elements that didn't require filling in in the first place doesn't really interest me. Now if the series would have been centered around characters completely disconnected from those who I've seen in the movies, maybe that would have been interesting, because we would have gotten a completely different perspective of Middle-earth. However, since the show largely revolves around Gandalf, Sauron, Galadriel, Elrond, Khazad Doom and the Rings, and the writers are trying their best to walk the line between fanservice and original storytelling, I found it very hard to stay invested. That said, if you're the kind of fan who craves answers and hates mysteries, then I guess you'll enjoy the show. The one aspect about the underlying theme of The Rings of Power Season 2 that I liked is how you don't need absolute power to corrupt someone absolutely. You need to just create the illusion of absolute power, and if people are desperate for survival, they'll accept it. If you look at it from the lens of real-life politics, which is how art is normally viewed, unless you belong to the anti-woke crowd, humanity's spirit has been crushed to such a dizzying extent that anyone who offers even the illusion of a solution seems like a god-sent messiah. But time and again, it has been proven that anyone who wears the mask of a benevolent savior always has ulterior motives. They have ulterior motives because they derive pleasure from the miseries of those seeking help from them. And I appreciate that fiction is mirroring this bitter truth of real life. That said, I have mixed feelings about the showrunner's decision to mirror the aesthetics of the movies. I mean, the whole point of the show was to start afresh and not seem like an extension of Peter Jackson's films. However, it seems like Payne, McKay and the rest of their team are relying more and more on Jackson and his team's work. Don't get me wrong, the show looks dazzling, mesmerizing, and occasionally scary as well. The production design, costume design, hair and makeup design, VFX, SFX, sound design, score, cinematography, editing, it's all fantastic. But since it's so reminiscent of the aforementioned brilliantly made trilogy, I can't help but think about how I'd rather be watching that instead of slogging through these poorly paced episodes. Coming to the performances in The Rings of Power Season 2, 
well, based on what I got to see in the first episodes, they're fine. Morfit Clark is an incredibly talented actress and she continues to prove that she is the best in the business. She gets to show so many different shades of Galadriel, thereby making her a three-dimensional person with flaws and idiosyncrasies, something that we didn't exactly get to see during the character's theatrical appearances in the form of Kate Blanchett. Markella Kavanagh seems alright. I appreciate the fact that Daniel Wayman is doing his own thing as Gandalf instead of trying to evoke Sir Ian McKellen. The same can be said about Robert Aramayo, who is playing a character that's been pretty much immortalized by Hugo Weaving. I just love how he portrays the dichotomy of being skeptical in a time when everyone is looking for hope. Charles Edwards is great. I just love this self-important attitude, albeit with a tinge of humility, that he exudes, and it perfectly captures the headspace that Lord Celebrimbo is in. Owen Arthur, Sophia Nomvite, and Peter Mullen are excellent. They inject the show with just the right amount of loud energy. Emma Horvath, Tristan Gravel, Lloyd Owen, and Cynthia Adai Robinson are okay. Ismail Cruz Cordova has a Bollywood-esque entry which says everything that needs to be said about the likability of the character. I have a lot of thoughts about the showrunners replacing Joseph Maul with Sam Hazeldean while writing Nazanin Bonyadi's character out of the show, even though both Maul and Bonyadi decided to not return for season 2. But I don't think the world is ready for them. Also, a round of applause for all the stunt experts and the actors in heavy orc makeup, dwarf beards, or heavy armor. They make the show feel alive. The Lord of the Rings The Rings of Power Season 2 is a well-made show, and there's no doubt about that. Every cent of the show's budget is up there for everyone to see, and you can sense that a lot of effort has been put into conjuring some of the most gorgeous-looking frames that have graced the small screen. It has a talented cast, and it has a somewhat relevant story to tell. But is that enough to make for a memorable viewing experience? I'm not really sure. If I got to watch all the episodes of the show, maybe I could have given you a more concrete answer to that question. However, based on what I've seen, the show seems like a fill-in-the-blanks questionnaire that I certainly didn't ask for. Like I said before, if that is your thing and you want to know about everything about a fictional world from the safest, most fan-servicing perspective imaginable, then The Rings of Power will be right up your alley. If the show ends up doing something radically different and mind-blowing between episodes 4 to 8, then I'll eat my words. If it doesn't, consider this my lukewarm recommendation for The Rings of Power Season 2. With all that said, do watch the theatrical versions of Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's something that you should watch at least once in your lifetime. If you do end up liking it, then and only then go for the extended editions. You can thank me later. Thank you for watching this video and do share your thoughts in the comment section below. Do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get your daily dose of cinema and series. See you in the next one and for the time being we're signing off. Bye.